Chapter 8. Derailed. Something tells me this isn't a circus act. Blood. It washed around my hooves, splashed against my legs, carried by the river that was Main Street. I was standing in the middle of the river. It was full of corpses. How many ponies have you slaughtered? Asked Velvet Remedy's voice, accusingly. It sure didn't take you long to become a mass murderer, did it, little Pip? V Velvet? I looked at her in a storm and blackness. Instead, my eyes found only the bullet-savaged wall of the sheriff's office. Crude spray paint covered it, shouting blasphemies. Raiders had been here. Their sickening hoofwork, sadistic mutilations on display for every pony to see. I watched as the pony torso that dangled from the ceiling inside, its limbs hacked off and coat shaved to the skin, heave against its chains and fall to the floor with a meaty thud. I tried to scream as it began to crawl towards me. With a wet rending, the splayed body on the wall, its flesh flayed back to show off its ribs and rotting organs, ripped itself free and slothed toward me, splashing in the water. I tried to back away, only to find my hooves mirrored by the muddy street. The crimson ichor of the water coated my pit buck and sunk into my coat around my legs. Calamity? Velvet? Help me! I screamed but my voice carried no sound. A silent sprite thought watched, doing nothing, as if the lower half of a slaver pony joined the things that crept maliciously towards me, a long rope of intestines dragging out behind it. I awoke, my heart thudding hard and my body covered in cold sweat, to the sound and shake of the train. I was weak, but warm, and less achy than I had any right to be. I was laying in one of the beds on the train's passenger car, a blanket over me. Besides me, Velvet Remedy was waving her horn tenderly over my recently crippled leg. To my amusement, my leg felt mended, if deeply itchy. I tried to shake the spec spe specter of my nightmare. This was not the first sleeping terror that my experiences outside had spawned, but this had been the most deeply unpleasant. The incorporation of my companions, or lack of them, somehow made this dream far, far worse. Velvet Remedy, the last I had seen her, she was fallen in a pool of her own blood, having saved nearly a dozen foals. My ears perked at the sounds around me, and looking over my shoulder, I saw the colts and fillies from the sheriff's cell taking up much of the passenger car. They looked weary and beaten. Two of them were fast asleep, but one had enough cheer to look at me, look at me and grin. That was awesome! The colt waved his hoof slowly through the air, and then stomped it down with a clop. I gave him a weak smile, my heart finally beginning to calm. Calamity turned from staring out the window to welcome me back to the land of the living. <clears throat> We're... okay? I was hesitant, half fearing that this was just another dream waiting to become a nightmare. Velvet Remedy nodded, reassuringly. The slaves? In the caboose, Velvet said softly, and less softly, this train only had one passenger car, and I felt the foals needed the space more dearly. So it was either the caboose or strapping them to a flat car. Speaking of which, and speaking of though I had suggested something awful was not, I decided, one of her more endearing personality traits. 
Suddenly, I remembered my original plan, and the locked pens that the pony captives had been caged in. But the locks... I knew Calamity could not have picked them, and I couldn't imagine Velvet Remedy, in her own youth, <clears throat> having piled that skill. She rolled her eyes at me. Oh, come now. I'm not the locksmith. You are. And I certainly don't have the level of telekinetic mastery that you showed. Most impressive, I should add. But I am a unicorn. I can do basic levitation. Between your missiles and the mines, I was able to bypass the need for lockpicks or keys. The train rumbled around us. Glancing out my window, I saw that we had already traversed the desert, and were clearly well on our way up the mountain. The pace of the train ponies was slowing. We were getting close to the peak point of the mountain track, and my conversation with Velvet had lulled, and now Calamity disrupted it completely. Our shadow's back. I pulled myself into a sitting position, testing my mended leg. Shadow? The colt who spoke up earlier declared, Mr. Calamity thinks something is following us. I noticed Calamity was crouching to the window, looking upwards through it towards the sky. Another. I kept myself from saying goddess in reference to the winged unicorn slaver I had battled. One of those? Like at the sheriff's? <clears throat> I don't think so. But there's something up there. Keeping just out of sight. If it's out of sight, then how do you know anything's there? Velvet countered. But at Calamity's look, she reiterated. Another Pegasus, perhaps? Calamity grimaced. I really don't think so. He returned his gaze to the window, quieting. At least it has stopped raining, Velvet Remedy announced, looking out the window. That storm lasted for days. I turned and looked out the thick, gray cloud cover. The water had indeed stopped falling from the sky, and the clouds were a much lighter color, turning the sunlight a drab gray. Velvet, I started. She smiled at me, and my heart soared, her previous grating remark instantly forgotten. Thank you, little Pip. Your bandages saved my life. I looked at her, knowing that there was no way those poor excuses for medical aid, magically treated or not, could have brought her health. <clears throat> I started to say as much, but she lifted a hoof to interrupt. No, but she managed just well enough that I regained consciousness, and from there I could take care of myself. She cast a sidelong look towards Calamity. Not to mention you and that interesting friend of yours. Calamity nickered in her direction. I stirred up my leg, surprised, and grinning, Velvet reminded me, Didn't I tell you I've always wanted to be a medical pony? I studied it, and even got apprenticed. I looked at the beautiful mare, many years my elder, curious. If that's what you wanted, why didn't you? Because my cutie mark showed up. One day, I sang a song to an ailing gentle pony, and it appeared. A songbird. A nightingale, to be precise. And, when your cutie mark appears, your place in the stable is decided. There was a sad matter-of-factness in her voice. It was a truth I knew too well. I even begged the overmare, but it clearly was to be my destiny to be an entertainer. My fate was written on my flanks. My voice was the most beautiful in the stable, and I could not deny that I could sing, or that I even enjoyed it a fair bit. The Overmare even showed me my genealogy, proving that I was many times granddaughter of Stable II's first Overmare, who herself was also a legendary singer. I nodded, having heard the heart-wrenching mu music myself while in Turnpike Tavern. How could I fight the weight of all that? The Overmare, she graciously allowed me to indulge my hobby in the small times when I wouldn't interfere with my duties of uplifting the stable's flagging morale. But my dreams, I was told, 
were not for me. Suspecting the answer, I had to ask the question. Velvet, why did you leave the stable? Velvet whined demurely. Again, because of my cutie mark. She turned, pulling away one of the medical boxes, to show me the nightingale on her flank. Wings outstretched, beak open in song. Do you see what it is not, little Pip? I saw what it was, what it has always been. A bird of beautiful, beautiful song. It's not a bird in a cage, Velvet Remedy said, her voice pleased. And, if it is not, then I was not meant to be either. Come horror or ill, I needed to be free. I'm going to take a walk outside, maybe stretch my wings. I looked up from the book I was reading to pass the time. Turns out, the equestrian army today was all about battle saddles. The train was slowing to nearly a stop. The engine had already crested the peak, and the train ponies were drawing the rest of the train down over a lip and around the next bend before releasing it and jumping aboard themselves. There wasn't going to be another chance to get some fresh air, or for Calamity to get himself a better look at our shadow. I nodded, bidding him to go, and Velvet Remedy was probably on her way back from the caboose. She had already been making regular checks on the adult ponies we had rescued, and I was entertaining taking a quick trot myself once she was there to watch the foals. I waited. Time seemed to have slowed to a crawl like the train itself. She was taking her sweet time. Had she possibly gotten lost? No, that was silly. You couldn't get lost on a train, could you? I chuckled as I realized that. If I ever got lost on a train, my Pip Buck's auto map spell would guide me. Poor Velvet. However, she could find. However, could she find her way on a train without it? I had offered Velvet Remedy her Pip Buck, but to my shock, she had refused it. I stressed how unbelievably useful a tool it is in the equestrian wasteland. She said I could keep it as a gift, and as an apology for giving it to me in the first place. She didn't blame herself for my leaving the stable, but she regretted having played a hoof, and truthfully a whole pony, in my decision. I had tried one last time, and she finally told me flatly, I escaped that prison. I will not wear its shackle no matter how gilded a shackle it might be. At that, she had left to check the ponies in the caboose. I was brought out to my retrieve by the draconic roar of minigun fire, followed by the death screams of the train ponies. A mere second later, I heard the switch pulling team, who were currently acting as guards, open fire in return. The foals began to panic, and I was attempting to calm, or at least corral them, when Velvet Remedy returned through the back door, looking worried. At nearly the same moment, one of the train ponies from the switch team burst in, shouting and waving his paws, a lover action shotgun floating by his side. Slaver ambush! Protect the children! What? How could they have gotten ahead of us? But before I could ask, a grizzly pony wearing slaver armor, spiked hooves coated in blood of the train ponies, broke into the passenger car and reared up, intending to end the life of another. I didn't have time to think. I just drew my assault rifle and fired at him. The train pony ducked, his own gun swinging around and unloading into the slaver. I couldn't tell who shot felled him. Flashes of my nightmare came back to me. I hesitated, but mercifully, only after the attacker had been taken down. And then with a stomp, I activated my EFS and watched the flurry of red marks fill my forward compass, milling about the few friendlies that were in front of me. I turned to Remedy, levitating out the needler gun and filling it with a marked clip. I had not been able to determine what the markings on the needle clip stood for, but I suspected any one of them could be at least capable of incapacitating. 
Take this. Guard the foals with your life. I'm going to help up ahead. Better to take them down before they got back this far. If I could. Velvet Remedy stared at the Needler pistol, as if it was diseased. I couldn't. Oh, for Celestia's sake. You have to! You're not going to survive out here if you aren't willing to fight back. I pour him towards the foals. And neither will the ones you're protecting. Velvet gulped. I, I mean, I don't know how. Oh, it's easy. Float it up, point this end at the bad guy, and to shoot, pull this lever back. It's the trigger. She nodded, then looked to me, as if hoping I would offer another option. I, I'm not a killer. I, I don't think I can. Learn to. It was a harsh, even brutal thing to say, but that was the equestrian wasteland. The train slid down the track, picking up speed, but slowly enough for the motley force of unicorn and earth pony slavers to leap aboard. Two earth ponies with minigun battle saddles had torn through the pulling team, shredding the poor ponies into red meat. The barrage of return fire had slaughtered them in return. I stood my ground on the boxcar, several cars forward of the passenger car that held Velvet Remedy in the foals. Assault rifle at the ready. My EFS compass was so full of red ahead of me that it was impossible to track individual opponents. Part of me wanted to attempt parlay, if only to avoid the growing pain in my conscience. But that was out of the question. No, any pony attacking the train went down. It was with this intention, firmly planted, that I opened fire on the first slaver to jump her way onto the boxcar ahead of me. My shot went wild, and she jumped back down. Damn it. I heard an explosion above and behind me. Casting my eyes to the sky, I saw Calamity dodging and weaving through the air, a griffin in hot pursuit. The enemy aviator held a brush gun, a much nastier firearm than any I'd seen so far, and occasionally slowed his pursuit of Calamity to fire a shot. Calamity, bless him, was making himself not an easy target, and costing the griffin distance with each failure. Failure. As I watched, Calamity suddenly swooped inward and fired a full loop, and to my dismay, the griffin matched his move, looping slightly inside of his own to close distance with him yet again. I heard the clopping coming closer, but as I turned my attention back to the boxcars ahead, I saw nothing. Confused, I took a step towards the edge, looking down to see if they were racing up along the ground, only to find three slaver ponies racing alongside my boxcar, passing me. Somewhere, a slaver unicorn was aiding them with spells. A magic glow held their hooves to the side of the moving train. Luna rape you with her horn, I growled, feeling incensed with the magical trickery, and swung around the assault rifle, firing into their hindquarters flanks and necks as they raced down the next boxcar towards the passenger car. Two ponies screamed as they fell from the train, mortally wounded, one breaking his neck in the fall, but the third made it to the gap between cars before I could bring my weapon to bear on him. The train was moving at a fair clop now, and I raced along the roof, jumping to the next car, and skidded to a stop. I looked down between the boxcars, and quickly pulled my head back as the slaver spotted me and fired a mouthful of submachine gun fire into the air where my head had just been. Focusing, I pulled the wide-eyed slaver up out of his hiding space, and then something hit me from behind, sending a stripe of searing pain up my back. I dropped him, the damnable lucky bastard falling safely onto the roof just across the gap. I was surrounded now, and the pony I had missed before had come up behind me while focusing on this new one, a whip clincher in her mouth that she wielded with hellish accuracy. With a crack of her whip, she knocked my assault rifle out of the air. The weapon sailed out over the cliff face. The track was skirting. The SMG slaver had taken my moment of surprise to reload, and now grinned. In his mind, 
he had already killed me. Another explosion from above, and two bullets ripped through the slaver, felling him. His body, SMG still clenched in his teeth, slid off the boxcar roof. A moment later, Calamity swooped low over the boxcar, and banked sharply, his hooves scraping along the cliff that rose up above us to the other side of the train. The griffin swooped over the train in pursuit. I ducked. The whip pony wasn't quick enough, and got clipped by one of the griffin's wings. The hit cleanly decapitating the slaver pony. I felt my heart skip a beat as I saw the blades that adorned the forward edge of the griffin's wings. Scooping up the decapitated pony's whip, I kicked the rocking head off the side of the train. I curled the whip into my saddlebags and brought up my combat shotgun and moved. First to one side of the boxcar, then the other. The spell the slavers were using changed the situation dramatically, and I was painfully worried about how many had gotten past me before I wised up to it. Further up the train, I heard more gunfire, as the remaining train ponies fought for their lives. Down the train, I thought I heard Velvet Remedy scream. I turned towards the sound, and my hindquarters to the front of the train, when something thumped hard somewhere towards the front of the train. And then, the train gave a shudder, as its wheels crunched through a body that had fallen down onto the tracks. Calamity landed deftly beside me. I stared at him in surprise, and he seemed to blush as he hoofed at his mane. I'm afraid Razorwing couldn't join us. He refused to get off my tail. Even when I swooped between two of the cars, Calamity smiled, looking around as if trying to find a missing friend. I swear, he was right behind me a moment ago. I smirked, then pointed a hoof towards the passenger car. Go help Velvet. Calamity nodded and took to the air, not even needing to fly, as the now galloping train brought the passenger car right to him. I saw him disappear into the gap in front of it, and then galloped to the aid of the train ponies. As I did so, a frightened voice in my head asked me what my life had become, what I was becoming. There were so many ponies who wanted to take my life, and that I was charging towards them. The last survivor of the train ponies and I raced across the rooftops and dived down into the open passenger car as twin pink beams scorched the sky, fired from a white unicorn raider's battle saddle. The train pony, who had been with us a second ago, was now nothing but sparkling pink ash blowing away in the wind. The passenger car was empty, sort of. The body of a black-coated slaver hung from the ceiling, filled with needles. The spell on its hooves was keeping it from falling to the floor, even after death. It gave the earth pony with me quite a start. To be honest, I might have shrieked just a little too. I tell ya, I prefer slavers who shoot bullets, the train pony gasped, recovering. You can't wrap a bandage around being turned to dust. I quite thoroughly agreed. Velvet Remedy ran in through the back door, coming off the flat car behind us. Seeing the train pony, she motioned for him to head behind her. Please. Go meet up with Calamity. He's at the caboose. We've got a nasty one on the way, I warned her. Another four coming from behind her. I think that's the last of them. But one is using a battle saddle with magical energy weapons. Velvet Remedy nodded warily, then looked up and pointed to the corpse above. Th this one came in on the roof, like an insect. She was clearly shaken, more at having taken the light than the strangeness of the circumstances. But, I suspected she couldn't bring herself to focus on that. Not yet. I began to wonder if her occasional unpleasantness wasn't part of some coping mechanism for dealing with the horrors of the equestrian wasteland. The earth pony trotted past her, reloading his weapon and bucking the door closed behind him. A minute later, Calamity galloped up. Every pony's in the caboose, and I've kicked it off. The slavers won't be getting them from here. He lowered his head and stomped on the floor. Here's where we hold the line. There was no time for discussion. Calamity had barely spoke his intent when three slavers, led by the unicorn pony, came into the car at us. 
not from in front or behind, but through the windows. The passenger car exploded into violence. Sats locked onto the slaver immediately coming from my left. At this range, I could hardly miss. Unfortunately, neither could they. Velvet Remedy's horn glowed as I fired into the chest of my first target, once and again. His armor stopped much of the damage, but it knocked him back. His own shot grazed my cheek. I turned to the second, but not quickly enough to stop him from swinging his magical enhanced sledgehammer right into my rib ribcage. The pain was blinding, and I could hear ribs snapping under my armor. My squeal of pain did not stop him from bringing down a second blow across my back. Ditsy Doo's armor dissipated the blows across my body, saving me from having a broken back and a very short, paralyzed life. Clemity had fired off a double shot from his battle saddle, tearing gaping holes in one of the slaver ponies coming from his side. Bloody innards splattered across the bed, wall, and window. The last went for Velvet Remedy. Oh, goddess, why isn't she wearing armor? I watched in horror as the floor, from the floor as the slaver sank his combat knife deep into her shoulder, barely missing her neck. Blood gushed around the blade and turned her charcoal coal, coat a wet black. Her spell imploded, the magic radiating from her horn, fading away in an instant. I started to get up, crying out again, as bright agony swashed over me with fiery fingers. My targeting spell was still refreshing, but my first opponent had already recovered and was bringing his gun to bear. The opponent with a sledgehammer swung around, intent on pummeling me into submission, the submission of a corpse. Calamity fired. The armor that had spared the slaver from my combat shotgun was not equal to my companion's powerful rifles. The slaver who had stabbed Velvet Remedy gasped the hit of the knife in his teeth, intent on pulling the blade out of the wounded singer. But Velvet's horn glowed once more. A telekinetic light enveloped the knife. It was simple, weak telekinesis, holding the blade. But it kept the Earth Pony from sliding out the blade as easily as she expected. And that briefest pause gave Calamity enough time to turn his barrels on her. He fired again, and Neville was splattered with wet bits of the other pony. I was in so much pain, my vision blurred heavily, and I was having trouble drawing breath. But at least now, it was, I thought hopefully, only three on one. But as the slaver raised his sledgehammer over my head, the door burst open. The white unicorn standing just outside the door opened fire with pink magical energy. With a flash from my horn, Sledgehammer Pony found himself pushed away, becoming an impromptu shield. An eye blink later, he was glowing pink dust. Now it really was three on one. And, while I had to fight through the pain to fire, my targeting spell had finally returned, and Sats guided my shots. And Calamity needed no aid at all. Velvet Remedy's horn glowed as she slowly mended my silver broken ribs, jumping slightly as the train gave a buck. The pain in my side had refused, reduced to a throbbing, bad enough to wring whimpers from me. Really, little Pip, this is becoming a habit. Her own coat was matted with her blood. The last of our healing potions had been consumed, and both she and I wore the last of our bandages. Only Calamity had made it through virtually unscathed. The slavers lay dead around us, save for the one who had plummeted me with a sledgehammer. His body had been vaporized, turned to glowing ash. I recoiled at the thought that that might have been me, or that I might have breathed some of him in. Some of him in. <clears throat> I turned away, staring at the floor. Though we had won, it didn't feel like a victory. Instead, I felt that we had led half a dozen train ponies to their slaughter. And, in the end, I had failed in the fight as well. If Calamity hasn't been, hadn't been with us... Reading me far too easily, Velvet Remedy tried to soothe me. At least you got the one with the horrible sledgehammer. 
All I managed to do was be a target. You were doing more than your share with your healing skills and mending spell, I pointed out, adding, although I'm surprised you didn't stay with the freed slaves and foals. Velvet Remedy whined. That caboose was too crowded as it was. If I had tried to force myself to stay there too, some pony would have suffocated. She finished tending to my wounds, frowning at the increased shaking of the train. She had seen her flashed by outside the windows. Yep, Calamity turned to us, making his way through the rattling train. Looks like that was the last of them. The train groaned dangerously as it tore around a corner, forcing us to catch ourselves. Velvet looked between us with alarm. Don't either of you ponies think we're going awfully fast? How does this train of yours slow down? We use the brakes. And where are they? In the caboose. Velvet's ears dripped back. She stared levelly at Calamity. The caboose? That would be the big red car at the back, right? The one you just kicked free of us? I felt a surge of panic. Calamity grimaced a little. Yep. Pondering. You know, that would explain the look the train pony was giving me. I begin to see how you got your name, Velvet said flatly. Several minutes of confirming our situation and arguing what should have been done followed the train, continued to race down the mountain out of control. Soon, the three of us were bracing ourselves against every turn. We were still only halfway down, sheer cliffs flying by on either side. And in the end, I decided there was only one solution. Calamity? Fly Velvet Remedy to safety. Velvet's eyes widened. But what about you? Resolutely, I stomped on the ground, trying to ignore the twing in my recent mended leg and hips and ribs. I'll be fine. I figured out another way off. The two of them looked doubtful, but they trusted me. So, with a nod, Calamity and Velvet made their way to the nearest flat car. I'll be back for you, Calamity promised as he spread his wings. The wind tore Calamity and Velvet off into the air. And then, I was alone. On a runaway train. Okay, I thought to myself. Now was the time to actually think of a way off. The train charged forward towards the mountain curve, hitting it far too fast. The train tilted, and I could feel its wheels coming off the track. My horn flared with power, cold sweat breaking across my already too abused body as I poured telekinetic power into holding the train on the track. The whole train glowed feebly as it ripped around the corner, canted crazily, riding only on one side of its wheels. With a squealing thud, the train righted itself on the track, already heading towards another turn. This one throwing the train's weight right against the rising cliff wall. The rocky wall raked at the train, gouging the boxcars and rending most of the roof off the passenger car with a resounding roar. I clenched my eyes against the storm of splinters. When I opened them again, wind was buffeting me fiercely through the gaping wound in the train car. I could see another turn ahead, this one even sharper. Trembling with exhaustion, I knew there was no way to prevent the train from leaping the tracks this time. I focused again, dreaming that I could levitate myself to safety. Groaning with the effort, I felt my hooves leave the ground, just as the engine car hit the curve and snapped around it. The massive weight of the train could not follow. With a horrific scream shudder. The jackknifing train tore from the track, soaring out over the cliff like a snake with a broken head, and plunged toward the valley over a thousand feet below. With all my remaining focus, I pushed myself up and away, lifting out of the open roof. But it was not enough. I was still falling, and fast. My efforts only slowed me enough that I got to see the train fall past me, diving down into the dead forest below with an almighty crash. The destruction below me 
was like the hoof of Luna against the land beneath. Great clouds bellowed up, obscuring the wreckage that I was about to splatter against. Calamity caught me! The three of us, Calamity, Velvet and I, trod through the narrow valley under the gray clouds above. I had no idea where we were, save that Absolusa was many days' travel on my pit box map. Assuming we could travel in anything close to a straight line, and assuming we were heading there at all. Based on the terminal entries, the slavers of Old Appaloosa were selling the bulk of ponies they captured to some pony named Stern in some place called Philadelphia. I had not lost my rage at what I had read, and the wicked and cruel things those ponies were doing. I kept it at a low slimmer in the back of my mind, and if I had my way, Philadelphia was next. But I could not ignore our more pressing concerns. We were desperately in need of medical supplies. Likewise, the water and food calamity I had packed was insufficient to support three ponies for several days. We needed safe shelter and resupply. Once together, we had rested for several hours. The three of us had just been going through a harrowing battle, and it would have been insane, if not impossible, to press on without giving ourselves time out. In truth, we needed much more than we took. I myself was so weakened by my extreme feats of telekinesis that I found myself unable to levitate even something as small and relatively light as Little Macintosh. But the unfamiliar and horrible environment did not encouragingly dally. <clears throat> the valley was strewn in black, dead trees, and bits of debris. Not from the train, whose crash site was now miles behind us. These told of deforestation of Equestria's Depocalypse. Fallen sky chariots and similar vehicles marred the land. According to Calamity, we were below the outskirts of what had once been, high above us, than the Pegasus city of Cloudsdale. Now, there was only nothing up there but the clouds. And on the ground, only the grave marker of the sudden ending of so many ponies' lives were the scattered remains of the Pegasus vehicles that had been too far from the city to be instantly consumed, but not far enough to save those pulling them. Inappropriately upbeat music, heavy on the tuba, floated like a siren song through the valley. My ears perked, and I began galloping towards the source. My surprised companions scrambled to follow suit. Little Pip! Willop gasped. What is it? Calamity was no less confused. He knew the sound of a sprite bot, but could fathom no reason which I would hurry to catch it. Reaching the sprite bot, I enveloped it with my horde of magical energy, dragging it to attention before me. Watcher! Calamity landed, looking at me strangely. Velvet considerably further behind, dropped to a trot, as she saw no sign that I was in immediate danger of being crippled yet again. Watcher! I shouted crossly, giving the annoying sprite bot a firm shake, as if doing so would shut off the music and summon my cryptic acquaintance. Watcher, I know you can hear me. I need you right now. Loyal Pip, Calamity slowly began. I don't think... He stopped. Eyes widened fearfully as the music ended in a mid-song pop and the sprite bot spoke directly at me in a voice he had never heard come from a sprite bot before. Uh, hello, little Pip. How can I help you? The tiny, artificial voice addressed me clearly, spooked my wasteland-experienced companions quite deeply. I need you to send a message to New Appaloosa. I waved a frantic hoof. There's a caboose headed down the mountain without the train. The train pony inside will make sure it reaches the bottom safely, but there are a lot of ponies inside, including five young ones who cannot survive out here on their own. New Appaloosa needs to send wagons to get them. Watcher was silent, hesitant. Watcher, they're not in good shape, 
They have no food or water. Time is of the essence. Watcher spoke slowly. I don't know, little Pip. I'm not in the habit of... I don't care, I shouted crossly. You care about these ponies, don't you? Do you want to see these fools die? No, uh, I mean, yes, I care. No, I don't want to... Then get help! I don't have time to indulge your shyness, Watcher. Lives are at stake. With a pop, the Sprite Spot song continued. I released it, unsure whether to feel relieved or disgusted. Little Pip, Velvet nickered, clopping up to me. If I keep ordering your friends around, you'll soon find you don't have any. I frowned, reminded suddenly of my friendliness, friendless nightmare. Calamity gave me a look that suggested she might be right. Velvet kept walking, and I fell in line behind her. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Light trot. You are agile, lucky, and always careful. Or maybe you have just mastered the art of self-levitation. Either way, you were never offset. You never set off enemy mines or floor-based traps. 